So why don't you just get a math fluent AI bot to do this? I mean, that's the whole that's the whole point of. I mean, yeah, exactly. Just, it, it's yeah. hard for you, but give it to an AI. Yeah. So one of the the things that we've had to try and do in string theory to extract some of these predictions is actually solve Einstein's equations for these extra compact dimensions. And we don't know any analytic solutions um, for how that means, you know, exact solutions you could write down on a piece of paper um, for Einstein's theory for the six dimensions that we would need um, for these, these string compactifications, they're called. In science, you can solve a problem analytically with an equation and say, there's the answer. Mm -hmm. And some you can't, and you have to actually run the experiment or, or increment a model and see the results each time just to see where it goes. Right. And so that's ugly. We hate those, but we kind of recognize that that's like in chaos theory, you have to sort of calculate it out. Right. You can't just write down the, the solution. So uh, if you're saying you can't in principle or it's just too laborious? Just not known how to do it yet. Um, so in general, solving Einstein's equations in any number of dimensions, you know, for any system is, is hard because they're nonlinear. So what that means is that the, the gravitational theory is actually back reacting or talking to itself. So the fact that you have gravitons, you know, the, the quantum mechanical description of gravity in the space, that can create more gravity. So this is really wild in terms of the differential equations because normally you could say, I find one solution to the theory and I find another and I can just add them together and still get a solution. But in general relativity, that doesn't work. You can't add two solutions and get another solution. You have to start over every time. Whoa. So, so, it, it, so when, we, when we model, we do this in astrophysics all the time, there's stuff that's just too complicated, but I know at any instant what's supposed to happen, and then I just lo load that up. But you, what you're doing is you're calculating with these differential equations, these equations that you can calculate at every time step. And right. it's following you on the time step, right? All right, but you can't just solve out the whole the whole shebang. So, gotcha. uh, so all right. So you, but so tell me again why you can't use AI? You so we can actually, and that's that's a, a fun topic. So um, I was involved for a number of years with numeric simulations, like you're describing, where you use a computer to try and solve the equations that you you can't otherwise. And historically, in order to do those computations, we had to put them on supercomputer clusters and like wait for months to get results. Um, but now, actually, um, with the advent of AI, this is something that my collaborators and I have worked on. And now you just do it on your iPhone, right? <laughs> <laughs> now we can actually do it on a laptop. Um, so we've started using machine learning algorithms to numerically solve some of these differential equations. So this is different than using, like, you know, looking at photos on the internet and then having AI generate a new photo. We don't have these solutions. So there isn't a database that you can train an AI model on but you can still use the framework of these neural networks to try and solve really complicated equations. And indeed, um, I've worked on that and then lots of other people in the field have, and we found that using these techniques, we can speed up a lot of computations in a really substantive way. And this actually made it possible just recently for groups to compute quark masses in string theory for the first time. So to be clear, these are not the quark mass values that we actually observe in nature. Um, that would be awesome, but we don't see that yet. But we can say, if you just hand me some extra dimensions, whatever they may be, and then say, what would the, you know, the quarks look like in that universe? Now we can actually come up with those numbers using machine learning algorithms. Chuck will go back on his ayahuasca trip and get the person from that dimension to verify Qu the quark, quark mass. mass. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and Chuck will be the oracle of physics. And I'm, a, I'm up for it. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> you, you, I, I'm, I'm ready to go, handle it. I'm ready to go do more ayahuasca. So I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm ready. <laughs> so uh, uh, let me ask another thing. You talk about what discoveries can come out of this. Is it possible, because this excites us all, mm. uh, we don't say it every day, but we feel it. Could any of this bring forth new physics? Because up till now, everything you've said has been within the framework of the quantum, quantum field theory, general relativity. And imagine before Einstein was born, you would not even know that relativity was a thing you could use to solve your problems. So is there some new physics waiting to emerge either, either out of your work or some yet to be born genius. The new physics could take a lot of different forms. Um, so, you know, one example might be perhaps there are more than the four fundamental forces that we've already observed in nature. So could there be, you know, a so-called fifth force, uh, another version of something like electromagnetism or, um, you know, the strong weak nuclear force? Um, that would be an example of new physics. Uh, other things that we know we don't understand very well include things like dark energy and dark matter. 
Um, questions like, you know, general relativity tells us that there are these disastrous infinities, you know, in the center of black holes, there's singularities. So what actually repairs those singularities in a quantum, uh, you know, gravitational theory? What, what tells us how physics really behaves inside there? Um, that's definitely new physics. And that would be the hope of the kind of thing you'd, you'd like to see. Oh, wow. So, 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 okay, so you think there's new physics out there? Not again. The claims on you know what can string theory deliver. I'm I'm still somewhat agnostic on that, um, but I think it's really interesting to try and push the theory to find out. Say you know can you show that this just can't be used to model our universe, which is a real possibility, and it's going to break somewhere you can't get there, or can you you push it to try and make some of this structure visible? So I just I'd love a hundred years from now look back on this conversation and say. Look at those idiots back in 2025. Right. Yeah, this will be a, a kindergarten video a hundred years from now. I hope so. <laughs> so I got something else here about a duality in string theory. What's going on there? Yeah, this is something that I and my collaborators are working on at the moment. That's a cool word, by the way, duality. I love duality. duality. So yeah. the idea behind duality is that you could have two different theories or two different geometries as they arise for these compact extra dimensions in string theory that secretly are different sides of the same coin. So an analogy that I give sometimes in talks is if you ever looked at some of these optical illusions photos on the internet where you know you have a picture that's either a vase if you look at it one way or two faces if you look at it the other way, you can say, you know, is it a vase or is it faces? And the answer is it's both, right? It's both packaged. The question in string theory is you have all these different, you know, half a billion configurations for extra dimensions. Do they all lead to different physics? And the answer that we think is no. Um, there are known equivalences of different so-called topological spaces. These are things that have, you know, a different geometric properties like their number of holes and their structure. Um, those different topological spaces can actually lead to the same physics that we would see. So that, if there's redundancy in that, that's really powerful because it means you don't have to search through half a billion possibilities. You can, you know, maybe sort of fold those possibilities in half and only look at some portion of them. Um, some of these dualities have been around for, you know, 20 years in string theory. And my collaborators and I think we have new examples uh, which require uh, less um, supersymmetry. So a less spherical cow than people had assumed in the past. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're growing some legs in the cow, for example. Um, and we think that this may improve our ability to calculate lots of things and also teach us some new properties mathematically about how these spaces can behave. Wait, wait, catch us up on supersymmetry. So supersymmetry is something that comes along for the ride um, for some formulations of string theory, which says that all the quarks and leptons that we see in nature may have additional partners. Um, so, for example, instead of, uh, you know, a quark, you have a squark, a, another partner um, that would be much heavier than the existing particles that we've seen. So when you're describing supersymmetry, it's a symmetry beyond the symmetries that are already known and loved in the standard model. That's right. So all these, these sort of three generations of, of quarks and leptons that we've seen already, um, there would be another whole set of those particles that would share many of their properties, but be heavier in mass and sort of the opposites in that each theory, you know, each particle that was, say, a boson would have a fermionic partner and so on. All right. So, so what you're saying is you're not content with just these three regimes we have in the standard model. Just hand us somewhere in the universe other regimes above that and see what properties they might have. And that could explain stuff that we don't now understand. That's an idea. And people initially thought this idea might explain some really um, important questions in particle physics, uh, for example, to do with the mass of the Higgs boson. That would be what's called low-scale supersymmetry. And particle experiments like the LHC searched very hard for this and didn't see it. So some people consider supersymmetry not a very useful idea because they thought, you know, it might appear in these regimes and it would not be useful. Um, people are reinvestigating this question in string theory. You know, some of the solutions are string theory or supersymmetric. Some are not. Um, what we generally would agree on is that if you did have supersymmetry, it would have to be at a very high scale. So it would be much, um, these particles would be much heavier than you could see at an experiment like the LHC. And that the symmetry would be spontaneously broken in universes like ours. So that by the time you got down to, you know, where we live now, you would only see the standard model particles of the re energy regimes that we can touch. I'm going to say that's rather convenient, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say.